The more important fundamental laws and facts of physical science have all been discovered, and these are so firmly established that the possibility of their ever being supplanted in consequence of new discoveries is exceedingly remote. These words, written by American physicist Albert Michelson in 1903, demonstrate the apparent state of physics at the dawn of the 20th century. So broad was the scope and explanatory power of the classical theories of Newton and Maxwell that some considered theoretical physics to have reached a point of completion. This view, however, soon proved to foreshadow a revolution in scientific thought. 1905 was a miracle year for an unlikely visionary. Having failed to secure an academic position after falling out with his professors, the 26-year-old Albert Einstein had to settle for work as a lowly clerk at the Swiss patent office in Bern to support his wife and baby son. And yet, in his spare time, he published four groundbreaking scientific papers that kick-started the modern theories of physics. One of these papers, on the electrodynamics of moving bodies, laid out the special theory of relativity. Imagine you're standing on the platform at a railway station. You throw a tennis ball along the platform, parallel to the track, at a speed we can call U. Now imagine a train thunders past the platform at a speed V. Your friend is on this train, and they also throw a tennis ball down the carriage, parallel to the track, at the same speed U, denoted here as U dash, as in this case U is equal to U dash. We can now simply ask, according to you on the platform, how fast was your friend's tennis ball moving? The seemingly simple answer to this question takes us back to Galileo in the 17th century, who would have answered that you would observe your friend's ball to travel at u plus v, that is to say, the speed it travelled according to them, plus the speed of the train therein. Let's introduce a new idea to make this a bit clearer. When we say something like the speed of the ball according to your friend, what we mean is the speed of the ball relative to the speed your friend also happens to be moving at. When we speak of the platform or of the train, we can call these reference frames. That is to say, an observer and their associated coordinate system within which they measure distances, times and speeds. So, to be clear, in your reference frame, your friend's ball is travelling at u plus v, the speed of the ball in their reference frame, u, plus the speed of their reference frame relative to u, v. It's also important to note that special relativity only applies to inertial reference frames, that is to say, reference frames that are either at rest, like the platform, or moving at a constant speed, like the train. Accelerating or decelerating frames are not inertial, and special relativity does not apply to them. This simple principle of adding these speeds together, known as Galilean relativity, is a basic part of the theory of classical mechanics developed by Galileo and Newton, that had lasted as one of the pillars of physics for more than 200 years by the time Einstein came to publish his miraculous papers. It applies seemingly universally to all physical bodies, whether they be tennis balls and trains, or stars and planets. However, the development of our understanding of the propagation of light by Maxwell over the decades preceding Einstein seemed to give rise to a conflict with Galilean relativity. It was Einstein, of course, who noticed and resolved this contradiction. Maxwell, following from the insights of Faraday before him, developed the theory of classical electrodynamics during the 1860s, which showed that moving electric and magnetic fields produce one another and propagate through space in the form of electromagnetic waves. The startling discovery Maxwell made was that these electromagnetic waves can only travel at one very particular speed in a vacuum, which was derived from fundamental physical constants to be precisely the same as the measured speed of light given by the letter C, about 300 million meters per second. This shows us that light is an electromagnetic wave. 
The fact that the speed of light in a vacuum is always c, that is to say it is the same in all inertial reference frames, is important for us to consider here. Let's go back to the platform and your friend on a train passing by. However, this time let's replace the tennis balls with torches. You on the platform shine your torch parallel to the track and the light propagates at speed c. Your friend on the train moving at v relative to you also shines their torch parallel to the track and of course the light here also propagates at c. Now we're ready to ask the key question that led Einstein to postulate a revision of Galilean relativity. According to you on the platform, how fast was the light from your friend's torch on the train moving? Using the tennis ball example, we might expect the answer to be C plus V, the speed of the light on the train plus the speed of the train. However, we know from Maxwell's equations that light moves at C in all inertial reference frames. So on the platform, you should observe your friend's beam of light to also move at C, the same speed they observe it to move on the train. Here lies our contradiction. Galilean relativity and Maxwell's electrodynamics can't both be right. Einstein came to realise that a fundamental misunderstanding inherent to classical mechanics was responsible for the contradiction that led to a remarkable revision of our physics of space and time. He examined the basic assumptions we were making in such physical systems as our train and torches example in order to determine what must hold true and which assumptions could be modified. He arrived at two postulates that must still apply, from which he deduced the conclusions of special relativity. Number one, the laws of physics are the same in every inertial reference frame. To explain this, in other words, there is never an experiment you could do to determine whether you're in one particular inertial frame or another. The laws of physics must remain the same in all of them. There is no preferred reference frame where physics behaves differently. In the reference frame of the platform, for example, a train thundered past, but in the reference frame of the train, the platform thundered past in the opposite direction. So long as the train isn't accelerating, so the frame is inertial, both frames are equally real. The laws of physics hold true in both of them. And number two, the speed of light in a vacuum is the same in every inertial reference frame, independent of the motion of the source, which we get from Maxwell's electrodynamics. Newton had famously argued that space and time were absolute and universal features of reality. Space was thought of as the arena within which material bodies moved in accordance with mechanical forces, and time was thought to progress at a consistent pace throughout the universe. However, Einstein realised that these were the assumptions of classical mechanics that must be modified. In order to account for the speed of light being the same for all observers, irrespective of the motion of reference frames, the Newtonian view of space and time must be false. We can recall from basic high school physics that speed is equal to distance divided by time. We now know from Einstein's second postulate that light is always observed to travel at speed c in a, back, in a vacuum. But if Newton's assumptions about space and time are mistaken, then how do we know that all observers will agree on the measurement of times and lengths for different reference frames? The remarkable conclusion that Einstein came to is that observers will not agree, but rather times and lengths depend on the motion of reference frames. This is the key insight of special relativity. Rather than observing light to propagate at C plus V on a moving train from the platform's reference frame as we might have expected from Galilean relativity, you would observe time to pass more slowly on the moving train relative to time on the platform, called time dilation, and lengths to be shorter on a moving train relative to a stationary train, 
called length contraction. The equation you can see on the screen describes this addition of speeds by taking special relativity into account. Newton believed three-dimensional space and the passage of universal time to be the same for all reference frames, with observed speeds varying between reference frames. Einstein showed, it, showed us that this was the wrong way round, with the speed of light being the same in all reference frames, and observed times and lengths varying between reference frames. These phenomena, known as time dilation and length contraction, are only observable at very high speeds close to the speed of light, much faster than the speeds we commonly observe on a daily basis. On our train, moving at an everyday speed, the relativistic effects would be so tiny as to be negligible. This is why the conclusions of special relativity seem so counterintuitive, since we never observe such phenomena on a daily basis. Nevertheless, there has been a wealth of experimental evidence confirming the predictions of special relativity in the century since its discovery, with a series of modern technologies from GPS to televisions relying on relativistic effects, showing time dilation and length contraction to be real natural phenomena. This, however, is only the beginning of the revolution in our understanding of physics that Michelson never considered possible. It turns out that when we derive equations to describe observations of times and lengths for different reference frames, known as the Lorentz transformations, the mathematics points towards a new coordinate system. Rather than a three-dimensional universe, special relativity shows us that the universe consists of four dimensions, three dimensions of space and one dimension of time, together known as space-time. So, in this 1905 paper, Einstein showed us that space and time are relative, the speed of light is absolute, and the universe is four-dimensional. Truly a revolution. Next time, I'll explain the intricate and beautiful connections between special relativity and four-dimensional space-time, covering Lorentz transformations, the space-time interval, the Minkowski inner product, and Einstein's most famous equation, E equals mc squared. If you enjoyed this video and would like to watch further videos such as that one, then give this video a like, subscribe to the Polymaths Paradise, and click the bell button so you get notified when we upload new videos.